Okay, so we want to do this part first, right? Obviously, the, it's color code. Yeah, I'm changing it there. Now you have the middle one. Oh, 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 you've done it wrong. Oh, wh whatever. It's the same thing. You get the idea. No, it's making me sad. <laughs> one second. Purple background. All right, cool. So, the American dream fundament is... Oh, what the... <sighs> okay. The American dream is fundamentally a belief in meritocracy. It's the idea that you can come from any social background and work your way to the top of the social ladder. For many, at least historically, the image this conjures is one of only a single family home in a cul-de-sac, two cars, two kids, and a high paying job. But what are the environmental consequences of living the American dream? All right, cool. Hello listeners, and welcome to Fighting Failure, the podcast where we discuss solutions to the climate crisis. I'm your host for this episode, Hisham Kanan. And I'm your co-host, Oscar Archibald. Unsustainable housing methods and ideologies have been integrated into society throughout the developed and developing world. At the helm of this increase in unsustainable housing has been the USA, hence this episode's title. To clarify, the American dream represents a certain idealistic American lifestyle. The biggest problem, from our perspective, is with this idea of cul-de-sac housing in suburban areas. However, it's worth noting that the American dream is a little more than a cul-de-sac house, two kids and two cars. According to a poll linked below, almost 80% of Americans agreed that having personal freedom was crucial to their American dream. And in this episode, we're going to discuss the environmental implications with America's cul-de-sac affliction. What? Affliction. affliction. Okay, sorry, I just completely misread that. I was like, application, affliction, okay. In this episode, we're going to discuss the environmental implications with America's cul-de-sac affliction and how we can fix them. Anything to add, Oz? Uh, no, because this is scripted, right? Yeah. All right, so on to the problems. Article 25. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. So as we've just heard, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, housing is one of the most basic provisions that needs to be ensured in a functioning society. So the real problem is, what is a stable housing situation? Cul-de-sac developers in the USA advertise cul-de-sac developments as safe, structured investments that reduce strain on urban centers, in particular through reduced traffic. To be clear, cul-de-sac is a French word meaning a passage closed on one side, so basically a dead end. Hence, cul-de-sac housing is generally when you have a system of driveways funneling into sprawling developments of single-family housing. Anyway, the idea that cul-de-sacs could reduce the strain of population on traffic has actually been proved to be the opposite, as more people commute by car rather than walking, cycling, or using public transport. Moreover, the housing industry made this cul-de-sac housing layout seem more appealing to the public eye by marketing it as just that, the typical American home. This increased normality and idealization of the idea of cul-de-sac developments. So what's the actual problem with cul-de-sacs? So sort of the basis of all the problems we're going to discuss is that the development of cul-de-sacs encourages the growth of population. So just keep that in mind when we're going through these problems. It's mostly because more population is moving into these areas and hence certain services need to be provided. Yeah, and additionally, the kind of idea with this um, the American dream cul-de-sac home is that it has, you know, sufficient space for those two to three children. And because you have that, the, the luxury of that space, it then encourages the growth of a family that might be larger than is really practical. So uh, as housing areas expand, more schools are required to educate the children in the new area. Uh, all across the developed world where education is provided free, you know, like in the USA, in the UK, you generally have this sort of segmentation geographically of like in the US, you call them school districts, districts in the UK, catchment areas is generally the term, I think. So you'd have sort of a sort of central school and the area around the school is uh, people that would go to that school if they uh, go in uh, public or state education. You know, as an Australian, we use the word public to mean a state-funded school. But then in the UK, the word public generally refers to uh, private schools, which is confusing. Um, so I'll stick to the term state school. But in countries, especially the USA, UK, uh, these sort of developed nations and, uh, you know, Japan, China, all across the world, really, uh, where there's good public education, uh, when municipal areas expand, when suburbs expand, the municipal government that's in charge will uh, have to provide uh, schools for the new population. And so there's a few problems with this. So 
I guess there's two ways, right, that the government could go about this. They could build tons of small schools uh, and or they could build a small number of big schools. And this already sort of happens in a sense that you have a lot of primary schools, like in my area, it's probably uh, state primary schools, but only state secondary school. They tend to be a lot bigger anyway. But if lots of small schools are built, this could mean that they have fewer students, therefore they get less funding and we end up with worse education for those students. And if uh, towns build a lot of, uh, sorry, not a lot, but fewer uh, larger schools, people will have to travel further, which could potentially exacerbate inequality in terms of which peoples have access to which methods of transport. Some people might have to walk for an hour. This is some people who could take a five minute car ride. And of course, it does increase transport emissions as, as well. I guess the final point about schools is that when these new schools are purpose built compared to, uh, you know, in an urban area, you'll often have schools that are really old, you know, been there 40, 50, maybe 100 years or that are built from old buildings. I know uh, in Oxford, it, quite a few of the private schools uh, actually just sort of use old town buildings. And, you know, my, my dentist is in a townhouse, not too dissimilar to my own, um, which is quite funny almost. Uh, the, <laughs> having, you know, grown up in Australia, or at least when I used to live overseas, we would have our dentist appointments in Australia. Uh, you know, it's always in a big, you know, great purpose-built building. It's a bit, a bit funny to see. But anyway, that's a sort of side tangent. Uh, but the, uh, when these schools are being purpose-built, and this is the same with any other sort of municipal amenities and any other amenities for that matter that are being built for this new sort of suburban area, there's a large carbon footprint from their construction, land use, and resource use. So the construction we're going to talk about later about materials required for the growth of suburbia. Uh, but, you know, these sort of schools tend to have very large grounds because they can. Uh, so they often have really large sprawling campuses. Uh, maybe they only build it, you know, one story high because what's the point of going two stories? You can just build outwards. It's ch probably cheaper that way because the land is cheaper than building vertically. And also continued resource use from having a huge campus. You need a lot of water for cleaning as well as, you know, people going to the toilet or, I don't know, filling your beakers in a science experiment. Maybe not the biggest toll on humanity, but... And then, of course, electrical use as well, or electricity use uh, to sustain a large campus. Um, and this is, again, the same if you, know, if you build more government buildings or uh, if you build other sort of uh, town-subsidized amenities in suburbia. Yeah, and so then this... So these other amenities um, include, like, petrol stations, um, because you need to accommodate for the growth in population the growth in housing area, so there needs to be more ex uh, close, like nearby accessible petrol stations um, that can supply the increased number of cars um, as a result of kind of that sort of integrated um, kind of lifestyle ideology that are kind of built into the American cul-de-sacs as a result of the kind of like two, two car garages in a lot of cul-de-sacs sort of um, in the US and I'm assuming in the UK. There's a lot of two car garages, so there's this kind of promotion for an increase in, uh, yeah, I would, especially w like around where you are. The UK is quite different. Maybe we're at this point in the episode when we need to say that this, we're mainly talking about the USA here. So I think it is worth pointing out that it's very different in the UK. We have uh, a lot of much older cities that are built much more densely. So uh, in Oxford, almost no one has a garage. Almost no one has a garage. And it's almost entirely on street parking. And people generally don't have more than one car. It's because the city is built in a way which you can bike and walk to different places easily. And it's because of the density of the city. Exactly, exactly. So I think it's worth prefacing that when we talk about cul-de-sacs, we're talking about US and Canada and the sort of North American new development. It does occur across the world, but I think it's just worth focusing on one particular area so that we can make these generalizations a bit more safely. So anyway, um, then there's this increase in petrol stations, which then uh, there's more demand for petrol obviously and then that also puts more pressure on people to get cars because there's the availability of petrol stations nearby so then it's like may as well have a car because you can easily fuel it etc uh, next is kind of small like uh well not small i say probably quite large well you get you get a lot of like single stores and then a lot of these fortress malls as oscar's kind of put in the show notes um, that need to accommodate for the fact that people, as kind of urban sprawling occurs, there's this need to accommodate for people need easily accessible food sources, people need easy, easy, to, easy, to easily be able to go somewhere to get their hair cut. Um, and then there's all these leisure things, such as like getting your nails, places to get your nails done, places to buy clothes, etc. 
And so that needs to be easily accessible again. So then there's this encouragement for um, expansion in terms of like malls and grocery stores and other smaller stores. And a lot of these are built with um, and as kind of inaccessible by anything other than a car. You can't really bike to them. There's not bike racks. Um, and the kind of entryway is, it's, I mean, I've tried to bike into a, into kind of a superstore in the U.S. and it's really hard because it's like on a huge road and then it's through a, this huge parking lot with ton of, with tons of cars. And so it's kind of, it's hard to get in. Yeah. Surrounded by parking. And so it's just, it's kind of promoting again, um, transport by car and encouraging this kind of consumeristic mindset of purchasing cheap GMO, uh, non-organic non produce, fast fashion and um, fast food and foods that might not be all too great for the environment, such as burgers because of the beef, obviously sushi because of the fish and the current implications of fishing. Anything to add to that, Oz? Yeah, actually, there's a lot to add. There's a few different sections, perhaps. But I think the first one is about zoning. And this is going to be a really recurring topic in this episode is about zoning in the US and because of zoning, you have to have these sort of separate areas of a city. So you can't have a sort of a, a strip, no, you can't have like a convenience store or a corner store in most places in the US because it's illegal because the whole area is designated as uh, single family housing. Uh, and that means that, in fact, while maybe these places are trying to be convenient, there's nothing really convenient about having to drive to the supermarket. It's actually really interesting to look at the shopping habits of different people in different countries. And if you live in a sort of cul-de-sac uh, suburban development in the US, you probably go sh shopping once weekly or perhaps once fortnightly. You go to a big store like a Costco, Walmart, Whole Foods, one of those you know, big chains. Honestly, I know nothing about US supermarkets, but you'll go in your car, you may sit in traffic lights, it's you know, one hour, two hour journey. You pick up bulk food for the whole week uh, or the whole two weeks even. Yeah, I mean, it could really take one hour, two hours. It's a traffic, but it's also, you know, you it's it's a fairly long time to take get all of your groceries. Whereas if you live in a really uh, dense walkable uh, or bikeable place like uh, a lot of places in the UK, and especially the Netherlands, is a great example of this. You can just pick up food for the next one, two, three days because you can just stop by at the store on your way home, which is not so achievable because of the way uh, American cities are zoned. Uh, so yeah, that's really interesting. Is that it's and it's really not that convenient actually to get to these places because you know you have to drive, you know, have to sit in traffic lights uh, because of bad street design as well. And then you you know go into your supermarket your park and then you walk across the huge parking lot. Like I've done this before, not in the US but in Australia. You know, I, I've done this sort of thing. And then you there's an absolutely ginormous store and you're buying a lot of a lot of stuff to suit you for the next week or whatever compared to just sort of almost buying things on a whim for how you feel like uh and you could be a, maybe a bit more in tune with you know buying better produce as well if you buy from you know local sellers or you know small chains or your green grocers rather than from a huge walmart walmart or a big multinational conglomerate like Shoprite. um i don't know if costco is multinational but it's absolutely huge isn't it not multinational it's a huge but I would, if we're talking about the u.s multi-statal i know <laughs> And I think the other thing I want to talk about is how having these sort of fortress malls is in a way, it really encourages a consumeristic mindset because you have these, uh, it's because it takes so long to get there. It's, it's a destination in and of itself to go shopping. Like, and you know, that happens as well, you know, in Oxford, we have this walkable mall called Westgate, um, in the city center and, you know, people go there after school and they'll walk through the thing and it's actually quite, quite nice and well designed, but, I. Uh, so it's not a problem exclusive to the U.S. It's worth noting, but um, it is it is a problem still. You know, like in, I remember in, when I was in Melbourne, we'd go to this big mall called Chadston once a year to get all our clothes for the year because there's not as much shopping available in Malawi. And one thing you'd do is you'd be there all day, and so you'd have to have lunch there, and you'd go to a food court, and I don't know how many sort of environmentally friendly meat-free vegan options they're offering as much as you might be getting burgers from Burger King or I remember definitely getting sushi um, which obviously you know as he should said as the unsustainably uh, stuff unsustainable fish associated with that and <clears throat> if you have watched uh, Theo Ansel debunks veganism it doesn't have an episode number but we did that episode a, a couple of months ago now it was me and Theo Ansel debating uh, he loves to sort of fall back on rice being unsustainable or inhumane as, as a sort of way to deflect vegan arguments. So I just thought I'd note that on the sushi train in a sense. 
I would rather eat organic meat than uh, rice produced in countries where animals are being displaced to grow it, where workers are being abused to grow it, and where uh, there is it's basically the meat industry, but for workers and it's not also forget the fact that plants have feeling is <laughs> a lot of this basically just to grow a ton of rice <laughs> the moral implications of eating rice <laughs> I guess the last thing to point out is, like I said, dense urban centers aren't immune to this sort of consumeristic mindset, but I think they do sort of go about it in a better way. Uh, in, you know, the Netherlands or in the UK, uh, you have, uh, often you have pedestrianized high streets. So in Oxford, the high street itself, the, what's called the high street is not pedestrianized. It is, however, uh, no cars are allowed. It's only uh, bikes and uh, tr buses. But there are actually very nearby, like I said, Westgate. There's also Core Market, Queen Street, uh, based, uh, these fully pedestrianized streets. Um, and that means that it's you could sort of, you know, walk along the street at a slow pace, you know, go window shopping. And you, there's lots of these sort of smaller scale stores. And it also means like maybe this is a bit of a small point. But when you're buying things, you can only buy so much as you can carry. Um, so in that sense, you're sort of limited by what you're willing to carry as well. Which can be a good thing as well. Because then that kind of, it, demotiv it demotivates kind of the idea of bulk shopping. <clears throat> because, I mean, in in a place like the U.S. where you're, you know, going to the a mega store by commune um, in a, in a like, motorized vehicle, such as a car, you have, first of all, a huge trunk space, and cars are increasing in kind of trunk space. Um, and then you have the back seat, assuming you don't have, like, kids in the car. And so you're able to bulk shop, so you're able to buy a ton of stuff. And then it's also overwhelming. You go into the store, there's so much stuff. It, you've ta it's like a huge, it's like a long commune. You've gone, you, you know, it takes like an hour maybe in the store to get everything you need if you're bulk shopping. You've driven there, whatever, maybe it's 30 minutes away. You've driven there, you're in the store for an hour. And then you're like, well, I may as well just buy all this stuff and just throw it in my huge car, which I, I guess it's a good thing then if you're, if you're you know, if you're commuting by by bicycle or by by foot, I guess if you're if you're walking to the store, it can be better in terms of kind of demotivating the public from from bulk shopping because it's it's much harder to do so. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I guess if you are like me and you don't have a car because you know you live in a city that you can actually do that, then it works really well because uh, we don't do this sort of thing where you know you we shop you know, on a whim or, you know, we go to Cormac or whatever, but we get our stuff delivered um, by, you know, from the supermarket, they comes in a van and it's everything's delivered, but we have that, we don't spend a ton of time in the supermarket, but, you know, just on the app, you can add things when you need them and take off things as well. So you can, you're not subjected to when you go into a supermarket, they lay it out to make you want to buy. Oh, like, oh, actually, you know, I want that. Oh, and especially if you've got little kids, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I'd go shopping with my parents and especially if we're on holiday in Europe and we're like, oh my God, I want that. Oh my God, I want that. Oh my God. Oh, God, please, can we get that by me, please? And so um, when you have this sort of more granular control over the, you know, your supermarket basket through the app, um, you can reduce food waste because you're only really buying the things you need and, you know, you can change your order until the last minute. So you only really need to, you, you don't buy things on a whim and you don't waste as much food as you might otherwise. And if you do look at the data, this sort of bulk shopping in the U.S., means that US and Canada have a far higher food waste rate than we do in Europe, which is actually really interesting to see because people buy things a week before they need them. And you think this might not keep in the fridge or they might not want that thing by the end of the week. So it's it's really interesting how that works, if I'm honest. And our next point is, is land usage. Oscar, do you like to take this one? So single family housing, these sort of suburban amenities that we call them, and something called strodes, take up much more space than their dense urban counterparts. Uh, so it might be worth clarifying what is a strode. So if you've watched a lot of Not Just Bikes or uh, on YouTube, he popularizes this idea of something called a strode, which is a, an unholy cross between a street and a road. So a street um, is a way, you know, it's generally quite low speed and cars move through and there's a lot of driveways, uh, uh, either for shops along the street um, or for houses. 
and a road is a thoroughfare for traffic. Traffic goes at high speed. There shouldn't be many driveways. There should be obstructions, and it should be a efficient way to move motor vehicles. Um, but a strode is an unholy cross because it takes the worst elements of both. It takes the high speed, uh, unfriendliness to pedestrians and cyclists, uh, you know, wide roads of a road, um, and mixes it with the driveways and arteries and traffic lights that you might see on a street. Uh, it's a, it really is the worst of both worlds. But you see them all across the U.S. and Canada, um, basically throughout suburbia, not cul-de-sacs per se, but um, throughout the, sort of the less dense parts of American cities and Canadian cities as well. Take note that this process of cities expanding outward by building new suburbs is known as urban sprawl. Yeah, so urban sprawl is the technical term, and we'll be using that from now on. Uh, and something else that I thought would be interesting, a bit of a tangent to note, is that economically, you know, we're about environmental sustainability primarily. Uh, there's also economic sustainability. And actually, uh, suburbia is almost like a Ponzi scheme in the way that uh, it's too expensive to maintain. You know, there's too many roads that degrade. And the only way you can um, sort of keep suburbia going economically is to build more suburbia to bring in more taxes to try and repair the old roads because roads need more and more repairs as they get older so it is like a ponzi scheme that you need to bring in more suburbs to try and pay for the older ones um, and it's actually not economically sustainable to build suburbs uh, i thought that'd be worth noting um, because often you know there's a green pre pre bleh, often there's a green premium but in this case uh, it's very much sort of well it's not economically sustainable to build suburbs yeah and often as as the urban sprawl occurs, so as these new developments are built um, outwards from that urban area, um, these new developments are often encroaching on natural habitats and kind of forcing wildlife away. And this is a big problem throughout the U.S. I mean, Europe, this is a huge problem, but Europe's pretty much past that stage because Europe's already built so many cities that there's not really much in nature to encroach on at this point. Um, because really, as you build cities, you're reducing natural area because you're taking up more land to kind of put into an urban setting. And so as this land expands, you're having to reduce the tree line outside the city or encroach on whatever surrounding fields you, uh, you know, might be around the city. And so whatever natural habitats just outside your city line, as these uh, kind of suburbia is, is expanding, what you're doing is you're encroaching on that habitat. So you're, um, you're affecting um, kind of bigger wildlife, such as, you know, if you're in the U.S., like deer, coyotes, foxes are um, commonly affected by urban sprawl. And then additionally, you're affecting all the smaller wildlife. So all your your bugs, your, you know, fireflies, beetles, uh, flies, mosquitoes, even though that they're annoying, they're quite crucial in our ecosystems. And so you're, as these kind of suburban areas are expanding, you're reducing the amount of natural spaces for these other animals to kind of uh, to occur in. It's a really good point you made about Europe, because while we're you know putting a lot of blame on America for expanding its suburbia and destroying wildlife, Europe has absolutely undergone this process over the last millennia. When it was expanding its cities, it was definitely destroying wildlife, because like the UK 10,000 or so years ago was 100% or 99%, if not rainforest, temperate forest. It was it was almost entirely wooded. And if you look at it now, right, 50% is used for animal agriculture. That's definitely not wooded. And beyond that, there's so much that's, um, so much that's uh, urban areas. Uh, UK is dotted with cities. I, uh, if you compare it to when we were in Australia, you know, you've got Melbourne, but then you've basically just got the, you know, a bit of forest and then you've got the outback uh, or the bush. But, you know, in England, it's just constantly cities. Wherever you are, you're either in a town or you're in a city. There's not much space that's nowhere. Uh, unlike in the US where there is quite a lot of nowhere left. Uh, um, and so, you know, uh, the UK's forest coverage has just been drastically reduced. And so, you know, the UK and Europe as well, they have also destroyed their wildlife and perhaps continuing as well, but uh, on, a, on a smaller scale. And that's why we've tried to sort of introduce hedgerows back to in, uh, introduce diversity in cropland and, you know, try and reintroduce uh, wolves in some areas. Uh, and other sort of wildlife into forests. And that's why people are really opposing the HS2 uh, railway line. Uh, environmental groups usually probe a railway line, but this one is sort of cutting down ancient woodlands, which is not good. Um, and it's reducing the small amount of biodiversity we have left. So I think that's really worth pointing out as well. Um, and so our next point is 
this idea kind of uh, of manicured lawns and crystal clear pools. And so a lot of these kind of cul-de-sacs will have these this green grass, it's you know, uniform grass, very like thick, kind of velvety. So obviously not very diverse because it's a single type of, of grass. You're not letting any weeds grow. And a lot of that is being done using pesticides. So herbicides to kill the weeds, pesticides to kill the mosquitoes, because obviously people don't want mosquitoes biting them, but um, it's not really the way to, to go about things. And so to some people, it's, it's you know, especially in these kind of suburban areas, it's, it seems to be that the best option is to spray pesticides and herbicides on your lawn. And what this is doing is this is not, so the little surviving kind of uh, biodiversity within the city is being, you know, dramatically, uh, it's dramatically reducing. And so, um, like I was visiting some second cousins in the U.S. this summer, and they they do use pesticides on their lawn. And they, you know, at night we were sitting outside and there there were a couple of fireflies. And I was just wondering, you know, there were like, two or three fireflies and I was thinking, you know, before this was sort of an urban or suburban space, like the number of fireflies that you must have been getting, you know, around that time of year must have been just phenomenal. It must have been a, a, like a spectacle. And now it's just like two or three fireflies and I'm surprised that they're even alive because of the amount of pesticides and herbicides that are sprayed on that lawn. Um, and then the next thing about pools is um, obviously, you know, in, in, in our pools, we don't want algal uh, blooms, so we, we throw in a ton of chlorine, and chlorine is a chemical, and uh, if we get any chlorine bleed into the surrounding area, if there's any chlorine spills, um, obviously that, that will affect the plant life and um, bug life in that area, but also um, bugs that lay their eggs in, in water, um, if they attempt to like lay their eggs in a pool, for example, success rates are likely to be lower as a result of those chemicals. So there's a lot of ways that this kind of ideal garden and this ideal pool that you would have in your ideal cul-de-sac um, are actually very detrimental, very detrimental to the surrounding ecosystems. Yeah, 100%. And obviously both of these require excessive water usage, um, but we'll, <clears throat> we'll be coming back to that a bit later in this episode. So the most prolific expansion that we see in American suburbia is in the US Southwest. You know, cities like Phoenix, Arizona is a big example, which are actually probably the most inhospitable areas of the US, maybe with the exception of rural Alaska, to uh, uh, to buildings. Not only are there no natural resources like timber to actually build houses that all has to be imported from the other parts of the United States, there's very little natural rainfall. Like Phoenix is probably the, the most unlikely place to build a city, really, uh, and it's thanks to sort of you know globalization, modernization, and you know n don't have any problem with those specifically, but it's a bit sort of out of tune with nature, I guess. It it increases the kind of need for nearby agriculture, and so then this exacerbates the problem of trying to grow crops in kind of areas where they're not meant to naturally occur. So like in the southwest, in like these kind of desert areas, dry areas, and um, you, you get people trying to to grow corn. You get people trying to grow, uh, you know, wheat and such crops. Even alfalfa, which isn't even used for consumption by humans. It's really not sustainable because you need to use tillage. You need obviously excessive amounts of water because there's no there, or there's very little natural rainfall. I mean, you need pesticides, herbicides. Probably need GMO to make it more um, reliable to make it a more reliable crop on less water. Um, it's it's hugely unsustainable to try and force agriculture into areas where, you know, plant life um, like such wouldn't naturally occur, and so it kind of it's it, uh, kind of putting an urban population in that area, then increases the the demand for agriculture coming from that area, so that there's an easier supply for food in that area, and then therefore exacerbating that problem. Yeah. So the Colorado River is a really good example of this, uh, where there's sort of a big skirmish, in a sense, um, over the dwindling supply of water from said river between uh, farmers who sort of have this claim of prior preparation that they were there first, they claimed the water first in sort of that style of the American West of, you know, you claim it first and you're putting it to good use, you get it first. 
and the huge cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Phoenix, uh, that depend on the water from the Colorado River to, to the drinking water uh, and municipal water for all their citizens. And there is almost a question, you know, the claim of prior appropriation is sort of you can have it. If you got there first, you have the right to use it as long as you're putting it to good use. If you're just hoarding it, then then you're not allowed to use it. And there's almost coming to the point where it's a reckoning. Is it is farming in the Southwest a good use of the water? Like historically it always would have been because, you know, you're farming, you're not hoarding the water. But considering the sort of the way it is now, there is almost a question about that. Yeah, and might I add that kind of the West um, Americas are in the worst drought that we've seen. It's, it's something like, what, do you, do you know the exact statistic? It's like 100 years. Or, it's ridiculous. We're having this crazy, probably ever, it's the this crazy, yeah, it's 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 100% um, climate change driven drought and it's likely, um, the statistics say that it's likely to last until 2030. And so then having urban areas expanding in places like the Southwest, like Arizona, uh, in, in, you know, in, in, you know, that kind of desert area and increasing that strain and that need for, um, agriculture coming from that area is hugely unsustainable because you need increased water. You're probably going to get less yield and you're going to need, obviously you're going to need tillage and you're going to need, um, even probably you're going to need GMO 100% to grow in that area. And so it's just, it's, you know, this whole, the, the, you know, climate change crisis is kind of, um, making that whole idea of, of settling in these kind of inhospitable, otherwise inhospitable, otherwise settling in these otherwise inhospitable areas, even less ideal. While any sort of urban development will require more electricity because, you know, people are using lights and computers and Wi-Fi, whatever. Um, suburban homes and especially single family detached housing is probably the worst offender because, you know, they're exposed on five out of six sides if they're, if, if they're a cube. Uh, and this means that they lose heat, whether that's powered by a fuel oil, gas is probably the most likely, or electric resistance heating. They're going to be losing heat on all of their sides. They have very little insulation. Uh, and they also tend to be much larger than, you know, a big single family home is much bigger than a small apartment in New York. Uh, so they need much more coverage from light. Uh, you know, you'll have more lights across the house and you'll have, you know, more heating across the house as well. So, and it's worth noting that suburbia is worse in terms of its electricity and other energy consumption compared to the same number of people living in a dense urban area. And finally, the materials used to build uh, such houses can be hugely detrimental, especially if they're these sort of quick built houses in urban areas. So probably the biggest offending material here is concrete. Um, it is one of the most widely used substances on the planet. And according to The Guardian, if the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest carbon dioxide emitter in the world, with up to 2.8 billion tons of CO2 equivalent, surpassed only by China and the United States. Now, <laughs> news organizations love this, if X were a country coverage, you know, it's if food waste were a coverage, or if steel were a co co not coverage, but a country. It's, it's quite funny, but anyway. And then the second quote from The Guardian is, taking in all stages of production, Concrete is said to be responsible for 4 to 8% of the world's carbon dioxide pollution. So to expand, um, windblown concrete residue has also been known to cause respiratory diseases such as silicosis. And so um, keeping that in mind, um, another quote from The Guardian, in a single year, there's enough to patio over every hill, dale, nook and cranny in, in England, uh, enough concrete that is. And so if you think about the amount of concrete being put out, the amount of concrete being laid down to build houses, to build infrastructure, to expand our cities, the first of all, the air pollution from that is ridiculous in terms of health. And then B, think about the amount of CO2 put out by the production process and by the, you know, kind of um, environmental implications of laying down the concrete and limiting grass coverage, forest coverage, etc. Um, concrete is a huge problem and huge ecosystem destructor. And then secondly, a lot of these faux wood planks, such as hardy wood, that are so commonly used in modern housing are also made of con concrete, even though it might not seem like it. And I've seen these, 
I only found this out when making the show notes to this episode, actually. Because there's these faux wood um, slabs around my grandma's development in the USA. Um, you see them everywhere. And I never knew. I just thought that they were plastic, which, you know, obviously isn't much better. But um, they're concrete. And for obvious reasons, you know, as, as we've kind of stated, you know, a minute ago, that's not, you know, a great thing to just increase, uh, increase concrete uh, consumption by putting it in what we build our houses um, out of. Oscar, would you like to? Yeah. And another big culprit, perhaps not in suburbia, but maybe this is actually more for dense urban areas or high-rise buildings, steel is also hugely carbon intensive in its production. And lastly, ecosystem destruction has become an increasing problem surrounding the extraction of clay and stone necessary to make bricks and other building materials. You know, also if you're using timber that's not being sourced from a plantation and has instead been cutting down wild forest, that's also a big problem. Or if the uh, plantation is not being sustainably managed, um, that again, timber is not, it, it can be, it's a great material if it's used well um, and managed well, but it's uh, ripe for uh, abuse as well. So all of these problems we've been discussing, there's sort of a foundation problem maybe made of concrete, I don't know, that exists, that sort of underlines all of these. And it's sort of a two-part problem. It's population increase uh, and urbanization, uh, which is the movement of people from rural to urban areas. All of suburbia is sort of fueled because people are either moving, for, or sort of three ways, I guess, people are moving from the city centre to the suburbs, moving from rural areas to the suburbs, or people in the suburbs are having more children. We sort of discussed this at the very start as well. And so that none of these problems would exist if that were, wasn't a problem, but that's not necessarily a solution either uh, to try and mitigate those based problems. We have to mitigate the effects. And a lot of the environmental effects of these problems comes down to rules in North America, specifically building codes and zoning laws. Uh, and these are sort of the rules that, especially zoning laws, that mean that we can only build certain houses in certain areas, specifically that most of the United States is zoned specifically for single family residential zoning. Uh, which means that you have to build, um, oh, you could only build a house for one family, so it's a detached house. Uh, and there's also generally rules about how much parking you have to have, parking minimums, which is another topic in and of itself. And you have to have a certain amount of garden or a certain lot size or a certain lot percentage uh, when these new developments are being made. So uh, zoning laws and building codes make up a huge part of the problem of why the effect of this population increase in this move to suburbia is so devastating for the environment. Uh, and the second sort of part of the real problem underlying this is there is a social stigma in the US against multifamily housing. That, you know, this idea that if you live in a duplex or quadplex that you don't have as much position in society, which is completely ridiculous um, because there's, there's nothing wrong with duplex housing. But there can, there is a sort of social stigma against multifamily housing as well that means that people, this American dream is one of living in a detached house in a cul-de-sac. So the first potential solution for solving suburbia, if you will, is to slow population growth. Uh, and I'm just basically going to defer you here to episode 24, if you haven't already listened to that. That's where we discussed overpopulation. Uh, and while limiting the increase in new population can go away towards limiting urban sprawl, it's by no means an entire solution, as movement from city centres to suburbs or rural areas to city can still fuel urban sprawl. And also, it's not going to be possible to just halt population growth in its tracks, as you'll hear if you listen to number 24. And again, those two go kind of hand in hand. So 
um, urban sprawl can kind of um, can kind of accommodate for an increase in population and therefore can kind of promote in a sense um, you know in increased childbirthing which can then cause overpopulation so these two kind of go hand in hand you can't address one without addressing the other yeah so I think probably the one of the best solutions we have is revamping and renewing zoning laws and building codes. So we need to allow duplex, quadplex, and multifamily apartment buildings in residential areas as well as in urban centers. We need to remove minimum parking requirements in buildings in the USA so that buildings can build how much parking they think is reasonable, not how much ridiculous amount of parking the state mandates or the municipal area mandates. Uh, and we also need to move other sort of car inf uh, car centric infrastructure requirements across the USA and across the whole world. Uh, so what this change in zoning laws will allow, it will allow denser urban developments. So we will be able to have large apartment blocks or other vertical, vertically stacked multifamily housing that's much more efficient on land use. If you have lots of apartments stacked up, you can fit so many times more people than like one single family house in an attached area. Uh, and in terms of suburbia that already exists, it's not that efficient to try and change it. But one thing that we can do is retrofit single family homes into duplexes. So it's a simple ish renovation that can be done. If the zoning law is changed, it means that people, uh, homeowners who may want to sell their property could actually divide the property in two, sort of down the middle or potentially down the back uh, and make it into a duplex, potentially even a quadplex uh, house uh, to allow multiple families to live on that single lot. So there's something that gets done a, a small amount here in the UK. We have these sort of very old houses, but um, you you will see people sometimes. It's not super common, but it happens a bit. Is that you know they split the house in two? Especially often they'll sort of split off the basement, um, and sometimes they can even split it more finely than that uh, to have a sort of you know I know house number eighty nine A and house eighty nine B. Uh, it's common enough because of the zoning laws. It's a, You're allowed to do that. It's not common, but you're allowed to do that. And it means that more people can fit in the same space without needing to build new housing. But but I think probably the most effective solution is so that we change the zoning law so that going forward, we can build much more effective and much more affordable housing as well. Yeah. Have we done denser urban development yet? Did you do that with us? Okay. No. And I think... Denser urban areas are much better for the people that live in them as well, especially kids. I think one thing that you see in the U.S. is kids have this sort of isolation because living in suburbia, you can't really walk very far. If you look at the layout of cul-de-sacs, uh, I saw this example online that they're in some area somewhere. There's two houses that share a backyard but take two hours to walk between because of the system of cul-de-sacs um, and dead ends and strange pathways that make up the neighborhood in order to try and reduce traffic uh, in a sense. And if you look at the sort of Instagram picture that I've, I've illustrated for this episode, uh, what I've done, and I think that's quite smart. I don't know if other people do, but what I've done is I've taken the, the numbers 25 and then sort of just integrated them as roads into a sort of horrible cul-de-sac system. And if you look at two bits of road that are mere, you know, a couple of car widths apart, uh, it's still, you know, there's basically no route on the map that I've created between them. You'd have to go off the map somewhere, I presume, to actually find a route between them, um, which is really quite crazy, if I'm honest. Uh, and we don't really have that in the UK. Well, that's a lie. Uh, where I am and in Oxford, you don't really have that. I think there definitely are places in the UK, especially sort of new housing states that do have this sort of cul-de-sac-ish style system. But I think one key difference that we see here. Uh, is a focus on much more multifamily housing. So uh, in Oxford, there is a sort of newish development called Waterways, uh, and it's sort of relatively modern housing um, that's been developed, uh, and it is sort of cul de sac -y. There are these sort of smallish roads with not much traffic, um, but all the houses are terraced, which means that uh, every house has got a house on both sides of it. Almost all the houses do, at least. Um, it's terror housing and it's multifamily housing and it's much denser and it can hold a lot of people. And the second thing is that it's it's very walkable. Places where cars can't get through, there are these sort of little walking slash cycling tracks, uh, which makes it pleasant to walk through as an, as an area. So that's sort of two key ways that we can build sort of better suburban areas. And then also in Oxford, there's a there's uh, apartment buildings as well in areas. And there's a couple of apartment buildings, waterways as well, I think, which are, you know, sort of not high rise per se, but, you know, five-ish stories or so. Um, and talking about five stories, actually, on a side note, 
uh, in the US, one of the biggest types of multifamily housing that developers build is called 501 housing. And that's because of an exception in building laws that allows that to be common. So it's five wood layers over a concrete base. And one of the ways to kind of make these urban areas denser per se is to kind of build upwards rather than outwards. So urban sprawling is, you know, as the name suggests, so we're kind of moving outwards, we're kind of, um, we're conquering outwards, we're encroaching on the environment sort of in an, in an outwards movement. So um, expanding and kind of like, tends to be like circular zones around the city. And, and that's as a result of kind of these like two story houses that house one family, then, you know, as the number of families increase, you know, A, because there's this, you know, because urban areas are more practical because of the way that they've been made out to be. Um, and, but B, because of, um, <clears throat> because of already existing um, uh, urban sprawling, kind of accommodating for an increase in population and then um, resulting in a need for more housing as kind of those children come of age and then have their own families. And so there's this increase and it's all outwards because there's a need for more houses, which means a need for more space because you need backyards, maybe a pool, um, that two-story house. It needs to be big enough to accommodate for that large family, that those two garages. But what you could rather do is, in a lot of these, what we consider denser cities, is build upwards. So um, instead of having, you know, instead of living in a two-story house, maybe there's like a, you know, I don't know, like a 10-story building that has kind of each floor has an apartment and so that's 10 in one and it kind of it can accommodate for sort of um a family but a smaller family and this can also be a good way of kind of um de i guess kind of demotivating the uh or de-incentivizing the public from having more than two children because there's less space to raise those kids when you live in these sort of um kind of multi-floor housing developments and, and it's it's a lot more practical because it then therefore means that you require less space, a less geographical space to kind of um, build up that urban area. Mm -hmm. I think, I can't remember what happened, but I didn't really get to mention my point about uh, kids in urban areas. But one thing I wanted to point out is that in the US, you're isolated until you're 16, then you can get a driver's license and suddenly you're free. Uh, and often you have to have supervision wherever you go anywhere and your parents have to drive you basically anywhere you want to go. And it's the same, you know, when I was living in Malawi is you can't get anywhere by yourself, really. But now that I live in Oxford, and this is the same for kids all across Europe, I think, is that you can, you know, I go to school by myself on my bike with no parental supervision. I can, you know, people can go out with their friends uh, and hang out without really asking their parents even. They just, you know, go on the way home from school or, you know, I can ask my parents and I can go hang out with my friends for like all day. I can just walk there. I can I can take my bike, uh, and you know we could just you can just. I remember when we first moved here, we we were frequent users of the playground in the park near us, and we would just you know hop over there and we just play with no parental supervision. And that independence that you can have without needing to drive is really really good. For, I think it's just it's really empowering for kids uh, and adults alike to not have this car dependence. So our next point is sort of yeah. Our next point is sort of green belts around cities to halt new suburban sprawling. Yeah. So this is a tactic that's been used heavily in the UK since the war, um, which was basically just introduced these things called green belts around all the major cities that meant like you just can't build there really. You can't build new, you can't keep sprawling the cities because that's just basically a no build zone. Uh, and what it led to was densification of the urban areas. Uh, and also, almost a bit annoyingly, people commuting in from these very far away cities or towns. But I think overall it was a good thing because it preserved the countryside as the countryside and it stopped the whole of the UK from turning into a concrete paved hellscape. All right, so our next point is um, improving public transport and walkability in cities. So this is something which is already quite common in a lot of Europe and in the UK, um, kind of around where Oscar lives. Um, because there's a lot of, you know, metro transport throughout so, sort of bigger cities. You can take the metro from place to place. Um, you can walk and bike easily because there's a lot of um, sidewalks and bike paths that have been made in a way that, you know, that can easily accommodate for a large, larger number of bikes. And there's less road systems and less access to buildings via uh, kind of via motorized vehicle, therefore kind of 
encouraging people to ride bikes or walk to work and reducing kind of the usage of motorized vehicles. And so, um, and this is also, you know, it, it, this can also be beneficial for, to people's health because if they're biking to work um, as a result of just practicality rather than driving to work, they're getting some sort of um, integrated fitness into their everyday lives. And so this can be beneficial to the public as well in terms of kind of their, their overall fitness um, within the community. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Please allow me to jump on that. I was just watching a video today about how in the US and Canada, if you cycle to work, you're a cyclist. And it's a sort of special segment of society almost that's been that's been invented by people who, who commute in cars because there's so little cycle infrastructure. You have to be pretty hardy to, to be a cyclist. And there's, there's very much a stereotype about it that these people are cyclists. Whereas in uh, the UK and in Europe especially in cycling friendly cities it's completely normal for people who aren't cyclists and aren't cycle mad to cycle because it's the convenient way and that's really almost a landmark of a really of a good city in terms of transport and, and walkability and good urban design is if people who cycle people choose cycle work out of convenience without being hardcore cyclists that's a really good sign i think but anyway continue with what you're saying before and so in the u.s kind of there's this this kind of large scale lack in this infrastructure. So um, I don't know if you've like been to New York, Boston, um, Chicago, there's some limited- no, I've never been to the US. But... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if the, the listeners are. Um... <laughs> I mean, we can look at the statistics. It's about 25% US listeners, I think. Yeah, anyway, so a lot of these, um, these cities, they have some sort of limited um, metro transport kind of throughout the city, but it's, it's sort of stigmatized um, and also because you know there's that availability for um, the usage of cars people often prefer that if it's um, if you know it's feasible for them if they can afford it and so metros aren't widely used in the US as a method of like public transport to limit um, you know single owner motorized vehicles and additionally kind of the fact that you can get um, licensed at the age of 16 in the US kind of pushes for that because then you're kind of easy, you're easily able to get around. And so then why not, you know, why not get another car or why not kind of give the 16 year old, the old car and get the family a new car. And so it's just, um, kind of adding to the strain of this kind of like over usage of, uh, motorized vehicles. And then we also don't really have, I mean, a, a lot of us cities, I know in Vermont, we have one or two, but we don't have a lot of public buses available. We don't, um, taxis are very hard to access. I mean, you do have taxis around, but they're very expensive and they're very busy. Um, Uber in the U S has become very impractical because it, you have to wait so long. There's not enough Uber drivers. So like all these kind of like, yeah. And there's a whole yeah. social problem about yeah, that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but, um, kind of all these, these kind of methods of, of sort of public transportation, um, aren't widely used in the U.S. and it's, I think, because they're, they're largely stigmatized because in the sort of American dream, it's integrated that, you know, you have a car, one or two cars. And, uh, and if you don't have that, you're sort of below what the average American is kind of made out to be or what the average American, um, as, you know, kind of per society should be. And so, therefore, you're kind of seen as uh, lower in the society. And it's the same as um, the societal stigma surrounding multifamily housing um, in terms of public transport, it's kind of like something that people often think of as, um, as you know, a method that you'd only use if you're kind of in some sort of financial crisis because it's, um, it's a lot cheaper. I mean, if you get like a pass as opposed to buying fuel every time you need to go, uh, every time you need to commune. And so... Um, there's a lot of problems in the U.S. and so kind of the expansion of public transport, so increasing uh, the reach of metros. The U.S. has basically no railroad systems. We have no, like you can't get from one state, it's really hard to get from one state to another via train. And the, even the trains are very not nice. They're not very luxury. And so um, they're not widely used. Whereas in Europe, I was able to take... Uh, a TGV from Paris directly to a small ski town in Italy. That's just one high-speed train. 
Imagine trying to do that in the US. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not just, it's just not available. And so um, increasing kind of railroad infrastructure, increasing kind of the reach of metros within cities and destigmatizing public transport are all very important in the shift towards public transportation and away from kind of, you know, single user motorized vehicles um, such as cars. And the last thing we've been talking about this a bit, almost in this bit, is removing this sort of societal stigma around, uh, you know, using public transport and living in multifamily housing. Um, and, you know, perhaps I've got two question marks on the end of this, but glamorizing high rise living in a sense. I think, you know, if you have, you know, social media influencers in a, what's it called, pen, penthouse? Yeah, penthouse. That's really glamorous. People might aspire to live in apartments. I don't know if that's really an effective solution, but that's just thought. It will require a societal shift, and that's hard, but I think it's definitely something to aim for. Um, and so before we finish, um, I've put a lot of interesting videos in the show notes, and I do this for every episode, but I think specifically for this one, there's a ton of great videos if you're interested in city planning and good urban planning and suburban hell uh, and affordable housing in the U.S., ton of good videos that I've linked below. Uh, you just click the little triangle and it opens up and you can see it. Uh, and those are great. I highly recommend you give them a watch. Any closing points before we end from you, Hisho? I don't have any. I don't have anything to add. So I think um, thank you for listening to this episode and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, guys. Bye.